Welcome to the e-commerce momentum podcast, where we focus on the people, the products, and the process of e-commerce selling today. Here's your host, Stephen Peterson. Welcome to e-commerce momentum podcast, episode 005, Kristen Ostrander. In this podcast, I don't think it's going to take you long to recognize the leader that Kristen really is. I think you'll be a fan as much as I am. In this segment, she's going to talk about running her business with a really tight budget. She's going to talk about working with a partner, in her case, her mom. And she's going to talk about running a business debt-free, cost-effectively. And when times get tough, you dig in and find better merchandise. Really great advice. She's also going to give you a great payroll withdrawal model that I really encourage you to consider setting up right from day one. So let's get into the podcast. All right. Welcome back to e-commerce momentum podcast. And today uh, we have somebody really exciting to me. Um, She, I said she, is a full-time seller. She's a blogger slash vlogger, and we're going to get into that at Mommy Income, and we're going to talk about that. And most importantly, she's a full-time wife, full-time mom, and a full-time seller. So I think that that is a great combination. And so uh, let's welcome Kristen Ostrander. Hello. Welcome. Hey, hey, hey. That's your line. Hey, right? hey. hey, hey, hey. Um, Kristen, why don't you tell us just a little bit more about you and your family um, and your situation with your selling situation too? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I am a wife of to my wonderful husband, Ben, of uh, 15 and a half years now, and I have three beautiful children. One's 14, one's 12, and one's five, and soon to be five. And um, so, yeah, that's a full time job in itself, but I'm also a full time seller on uh, Amazon FBA. And um, I do, I still do eBay too, but I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit about how I do that so it doesn't take up too much time. And um, I just I got started selling 2003 on eBay, sold my children's clothes and toys, and I've always been a thrifter and had a eye for a great deal, and I would like to turn that into cash. And so I started with eBay, and then when I heard about Amazon, it was just another great opportunity, so I looked into that and uh, started sending in some things to Amazon FBA, starting with books, starting easy, and... Um, My husband was injured in his job in 2010, and that was when I really took the plunge to do Amazon full-time. I thought, you know, this is a time where, you know, it was really needed in our lives, and I just decided that I'm just going to give it all I've got, and I haven't looked back since. I've been full-time FBA since 2010, and year over year, it's just getting better and better. You know, there, there are a couple things that, you know, I know a little bit of your background, a, you work with your mom, which is really interesting. I don't know how many people could do that, and that's going to be an interesting thing to talk about. And the second thing is I, I wanted to get a little deeper backwards. How how did you get – I mean, you're a leader for sure. Have you always been a leader? Did, is that just something natural? Is your mom the same way? Did you grow up that way? Uh, was it a big house? Did you, Where did that come from? Uh, I'm really not sure. You know, um, my parents were divorced growing up, and I grew up mostly with my dad for uh, most of my life. And you know, it was always a, it was we had a tight budget in the house, being a you know a single dad and a and two kids. And um, you know, my mom had and mom and I have an excellent relationship right now. My mom is the best person to work with. She's she's a lot like me. She's very easygoing and definitely not shy. Um, but I think maybe the leadership skills just came from kind of having to do everything myself. Um, Just, you know, growing up, my dad was always around and, you know, I had a happy childhood, but things were always, you know, money was always tight. So I was always looking for a way to, um, you know, there was things I wanted to buy and things I couldn't afford and we didn't get paid for chores. It was just a matter of you for, for a long time. We didn't, it was a matter of you grew up in this house and you contribute because that's what you do. And, you know, money is earned by doing extra work. And so I would just be thrifty when I got school clothes money, I would um, help other kids I knew do chores and then earn money from them and say, hey, why don't we split this? And, you know, so I don't know if it just the the business part came from that of just being able to say, hey, if I want something done right, I've got to do it myself, which now has kind of turned into a vice. But I think all my life I had that mentality of, you know, you just if you want something done, you just got to get it done. So that misindependence, huh? that's you. That's always written for you. <laughs> I suppose. That's funny. 
I met your mom and uh, in Baltimore, and you're right, she is independent. I I got that vibe. Uh, she is uh, so there. There is a strong in your relationship with her, right? Are you are your strengths her strengths? Are your strengths her weaknesses? What how's that how's that work? You know, we just work really well hand in hand together. I think the easygoingness of it is great. You know, I'll have a great idea and we'll go with that. And then she'll have a great idea. and We'll go with that. We do really well together because I'm more of a risk taker. I'm willing to kind of push all in on certain things. And she's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have to think about this and this and this. And so um, she, we, we really balance each other well because, you know, I, I can be a little bit more of a just being risky and taking a risk and no risk, no reward. And she's more of conservative. And I tell you, when we're doing retail arbitrage, she might not have an entire full cart like I do, but the stuff that she has in her cart, those are golden nuggets. So I know I can always count on her her um, conservativeness of being excellent products that she sources. So, so there's a generational issue here, and this is really interesting. So, so the first tip that you gave is if you're going to be in a, a, a partnership or some kind of deal with somebody, have a balanced relation. Make sure it's complementary, right? Absolutely. So, so it sounds complementary, too, is since there's a generational, do you guys look for different things? I mean, if, you, if I looked at your cart versus her cart, would I see differences? I think you would see differences in um, – <laughs> Sales ranking items, uh, how fast something's going to turn around, the profit margin on it. Um, I don't know that there's a generational gap for how we think about products. I think it's just, um, you know, it, it it's possible. But her and I don't think that way. We kind of learned the business together, and I taught her a lot about the business when she first came on board. And so she still uses a lot of those skills to, to source. But for her, I think it, it's not necessarily generational. She's got nine grandkids. She's always around us and our children. She knows what toys to look for. Um, she's up and up on some of the trends because we're starting to do clothing and shoes. So I'm not so sure that she's got that generational gap. She's really... She's really on the up and up, I tell you. Yeah, I, I thought she was pretty hip. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I would agree. And it's just interesting. So, the, you know, the, the generational thing is not um, – and I, I guess it's because – so she's real comfortable around computers and devices and those kind of things. Is that is that easy for her too? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think she's on her computer more than me. She is a well, research queen. And, and would she help with any uh, online arbitrage? She would. Um, she is more bent towards retail arbitrage. That's one of the reasons she got into this business is because even before this, she just loves to shop. She's got an eye for great things and new things, and um, she just likes to spend a lot of time in a store. We used to tease her that you know Target was going to throw her out because she was always there. They're going to think she's a spy. <laughs> Because mm. she could spend hours there, and now with retail arbitrage, now she has more of a pers uh, purpose. And so she just she likes to spend time with stores and look for things, and she picks high-quality items and things that are well. So she just used her amazing shopping skills and now makes money doing it. So that's even better. I like the way you said that, fulfilled her purpose. Because, you know, there is something to be said. You know, it is it is cool when you find things, and you're and when you're good at it, like you know you guys are, it is rewarding. So that's really neat the way you said that. So I'm sure it's all been roses and unicorns, right? Uh, every day, right? It's always easy. There's never a struggle. There's never a challenge. I'm going to ask you to dig deep and find one. I'm sure there has been one where you guys have struggled together, separately, whichever. Um, not necessarily just that, but just something that you struggled. And then you were able to overcome it, you know, and that's what we're looking for because the goal is to try to help people who are stuck. As you, you uh, to, by the way, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Kristen does coaching, but to help people with exactly these issues. But as you know, it's it's not that hard to get to, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars in sales doing this. It's getting that next level where you can really earn a living. It gets to be very challenging, and I think most people unfortunately, get to that point and stop, and they fall short of it for whatever reason. They just haven't been able to get past it. So since you've been successful and you've been past that point, help us understand something that you can use, that we could use and, and maybe listeners can use to go forward. Well, some of the stuck points that we've had over time, and there's been a couple of different movements um, from different levels, but I think the hardest part is that we really – like to run our business debt free. We don't like to take out a lot of loans and a lot of credit cards. And because of that, 
um, we we operate with what the cash flow that we have. And sometimes capital can be an issue because you kind of just hit the same slump of, okay, we've got to get over this hump. Our deposits have been the same for six weeks. We haven't been earning any extra. We're just kind of staying steady and we would like to see growth. And that's where we start digging in our heels and we start um, reevaluating our sourcing and our ROI and our profit margins and all those sort of things. And we really take a look at um, okay, at certain you know things. We have a lot of replens that go come in and out, so we will take a look at our numbers and we'll say, okay, these replens are still doing well. Um, what else can we do? And so we'll start sourcing um, because we we can't increase the amount of money that we're spending because we have a percentage of how we we run our finances. Um, the way that we have it set up is we we take all the way off the top, we take our 65% of whatever that deposit comes in and we put it back into our inventory. And we've played with these numbers for years because we earn a living from this. So we need to get our, so and then we, after that we take our expenses and we, then we take the profit that's left over in the bottom. And so we either have to cut our own paychecks, which we don't want to do, or we have to get creative about um, making better profit. So that's really what we try to do because we don't want to cut our own pay. So, so can you hold on a second? Because sure. that's a good point. I don't think anybody's – most people are afraid to say that, right, what you just said, right? So you're taking 65%. So let's just say you get $10, right? You're taking 65% off the top, and you're just rolling it back in, in inventory. That's right. Correct. That's your buying money, right? So that's – and that's probably double what you – paid for the last one. So that's really smart, right? So you're continually growing. It's, it's like a snowball, right? And so out of the other 35, you still have monthly expenses, fees, and all that jazz. And then from there, you're withdrawing your paychecks or taxes and all the rest of that jazz. Yep. That's a great model. And you've been using that for a long time? Um, mostly from the beginning. Um, from the beginning of when mom and I um, formed our partnership. It was a little bit different when I was solo. I think that's a smart move because I think I keep reading about people and, and most of the groups, they're talking about reinvesting everything, reinvest 100%. And and I, I think that gets – you get discouraged at some point. Hey, it gets harder to buy. When you're spending, you know, it does get harder to buy. Uh, I know there's there's no end to buying, but to buy good, high-turning deals, it is hard, right, to scale up. And so I think this is a smart move. This is great advice. Um, start right from the beginning pulling that out, and you build yourself up. And then you can build when you want to make more money. You just got to raise your sales and keep that going. I love that model. Yeah, you know it has worked for us. You know we started a little bit lower on the percentages. We don't have a lot of overhead. We don't have a lot of costs. We're very cost effective on the supplies that we buy and things like that. We don't we don't really have a lot of bills. There's not a whole lot with that. So our expenses are fairly low, and you know we like to maintain a certain salary, and so it's um. You know, so that's what we start looking at. We start looking at how are we spending our inventory money and what can we do better. And living in Michigan, um, garage sale season is a season. It's really, you know, the beginning of May until maybe the end of October and then it's over. But that's something that really gives us a good kickstart in the, in the beginning of garage sale season is we do, there's a lot of very good garage sales and estate sales and things in our area. And so we capitalize on that when we can through May, through end of October, whenever they end. So that's another way to really boost our ROI and our margins and all that is, you know, when you're buying stuff for inexpensive, I mean, you make your money when you buy. And so we buy very inexpensively and um, that helps with that. But otherwise, you know, we, we're, we're scouring Craigslist, we're looking at papers, we're looking at outside of the retail arbitrage, online arbitrage box to try to find store liquidations that are local, things that other people can't get their hands on because it's local to us. And we really try to capitalize on those opportunities because there's less competition when a store is going out of business right here where we are, as opposed to someone in Texas or California or somewhere else where they don't get those opportunities. It's just a great, another great piece of advice right there. So use uh, garage sales, estate sales elsewhere, other places, to boost your season, to kick it off, to get you going. I just think that's great. And, and as we know, right, that then carries you to the fourth quarter when you can really take advantage of it. So that's great advice. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about 
a little bit about those garage sales and estate sales because you still sell on eBay. And I'm intrigued to hear about, you know, how you handle eBay because I just think it's really fascinating. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Today's podcast is brought to you by Seller Essentials, essential business solution for online sellers. Whether you sell general merchandise on Amazon or eBay, private label your own product, or if your focus is selling books, wholesale products, or liquidation lots, let Seller Essentials be your online resource for all things e-commerce. Essential resources, essential solutions, Seller Essentials, the Internet's premier venue for online professional. Visit SellerEssentials.com for more information. That's SellerEssentials.com. Before we jump back into the podcast, I want to just point out a couple things from this segment. Kristen's going to talk about outsourcing her eBay business. I think it's a great win-win model. She has the best part that she enjoys. She keeps that in-house and outsources the rest. And I think there's some great advice here. I think it's very uh, applicable to other people and very easy to duplicate. In addition, she talks about a good, better, best model to implement in your business. And really, it's something you can take an approach to tomorrow. And I just think it's so great. And finally, she's going to talk about having an accountability partner and what that's done for her business and what it can do for yours. So let's get back into the podcast. All right, we're back. We're talking with Kristen Ostrander. And just before the break, we we were talking about um, how uh, Kristen and her mom kick off their season uh, with garage sales and yard sales, uh, estate sales, uh, liquidations, uh, things that are close to them to kick off and, and get momentum going. And I like that word momentum a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I want to hear a little bit about how Kristen handles eBay because I too love eBay and sell on eBay. And um, you, uh, from what I remember seeing some of your posts, you love the buying or the finding this the treasure for eBay. But you're not so great or in favor of the shipping and the picture taking and the rest of that jazz, correct? That is correct, yes. It's... So tell us about that. Well, um, I've been an eBayer since 2003, and I've always loved, I've always been a treasure hunter and a thrifter and, you know, started with my kids' stuff, getting things on the cheap, and then, you know, I heard of eBay, and I was hooked immediately when I figured my daughter could wear a dress for three months, and then I could sell it on eBay for more than what I paid for it. I was in. And so I, you know, I started with that, started at dollar stores before there was smartphones, and you could look everything up. I would buy, you know, name brand stuff that they still had at dollar stores and flip it on eBay for hundreds of dollars a month. And so I just kind of started from there and then got into, you know, selling things on eBay. But but that was before Amazon. And, you know, it was kind of a background hobby thing. You know, my husband had a full time job. But when Amazon came in, and I really did full time Amazon, eBay started to become a sticking point. I still love I still do garage sales. So I see the Amazon opportunities at garage sales, but I also see, oh, that would sell really well on eBay or I sold five of those last summer on eBay. And so I'll buy them. And then they kind of started collecting dust in what I call my eBay closet, which is still currently full. We all have one. We all have one. (laughs) So I really, um, when I was doing my goals for 2015, I sat down and I had some goals. And one of the goals was to hire out my eBay, to find somebody somewhere who could do the eBay that would be a win-win, that they would be able to make some extra money and I could make some money on it. And um, so I just put an ad on one of my Facebook groups. I'm a big advocate of Facebook groups that are local buy, sell, trade or virtual garage sale sites. You can meet local people. It's way safer than Craigslist because there's a face to a name and people have mutual friends and it's a community thing. And so I just put it in search of on one of the groups, uh, someone who's willing to, you know, has experience with eBay and willing to list. So I I got several responses and I interviewed each one of them and found a person that was a good fit. She was just looking for, you know, some extra, you know, a slush fund, so to speak. I mean, it wasn't paying her bills or anything, but she just, she loves the thrill of eBay. She loves auctions and loves to see how high they get. And she sells her own things on eBay. And so we created a scenario that, you know, she, I I basically bring her a, 
tote of items that I'd like her to sell on eBay for that week or however long it might take. We have a very easygoing relationship. And so I just drop the stuff off. She does everything from the pictures to the listings to the shipping. Um, I basically do the books. I drop the stuff off at her house. And then at the end of the pay period, I go through the fees and books and we um, take our percentages and it's very passive income for me and I really enjoy it. So you get the best part, right, which in your world, which is I love to buy. I love to hunt. I love to buy. That um, that fear of, oh, God, what am I going to do with it on the way home, that regret doesn't happen because you're taking and dropping it in somebody else's house. Absolutely. That's great. And so, you know, one, one question I have, right, is how do you handle um, her getting into your eBay account? I actually have two eBay accounts. Okay. So it's it's kind of a separate entity when we um, when my mom oh, great. When my mom and I merged our businesses um, and we actually did have an extra partner before um, that took place. We created an eBay account for those extra things that you know just in case they don't sell or this or that and um, so we actually used that account for that. So it was it's really not tied to much and uh, some people use Ink Frog. I have not personally used Inkfrog, but it's another way people can get into your eBay account without in getting into your personals. Right. That's what we use is Inkfrog. Yeah. Um, and that's how we do it. So it really works well. And we haven't had a problem. And um, so far, the, the account was kind of a low feedback type thing, and it has a separate PayPal account, and it's all separated. So it's kind of the honor system. I mean, I interviewed her, and we met face-to-face, -face and we talked, and we looked at things. So through the interview process, I deemed her trustworthy. And so far since January or February, maybe, we've had a great working relationship, and I'm really not fearful of that. So I'd say do your due diligence in the hiring process, and you won't have headaches later. Well, I think it sounds to me like you've done quite a bit of it up front. You put some controls in place, right? You have a separate eBay account first off, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to worry about that jeopardizing your main account. Um, you have a separate PayPal account. So it's very clean. It's very easy to see what goes in and what goes out. So I think that's really well thought out. Have you thought about uh, using another channel like Etsy, for example, and using and outsourcing that kind of service too? I'm not as familiar with Etsy, but I'm going to become familiar in this next year or so. It's on my to-do list. Um, I, I don't know much about the home. I, I've heard that Etsy is the homemade, handmade, custom-made kind of a site, that that's their niche, really. Um, I have helped some people develop business plans for Etsy because I find that's very similar to eBay, people that create things and don't know how to get started. But I, I'm no expert in Etsy at all. I just kind of lead people in the it, through the business end and the numbers end and the how-to end of how to kind of organize their business, whatever business that is, um, and head in that direction. But I'm not really an Etsy expert. Okay. Uh, today, when we interview you next year, my bet is you will be. Um, <laughs> they also do vintage, by the way, and that's what we're interested in. Oh. So um, I like that, you know, that uh, vintage toys and things like that, because we, we get uh, seem to get a bunch of that kind of jazz. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking back, you know, at how far you've come, you've got to be pretty proud of yourself. What would you say your biggest strength as an entrepreneur is? What's what's your strength? Um, I'm very disciplined and I'm very action based. I like to get things done. I like to that's the sense of accomplishment and success that I see. Even if it's the smallest thing, I like to say, This is what I did, this is what I accomplished today and I know that no one's gonna do it for me. If if I want anything done, I have to do it or I have to hire someone else to do it and I have to be on top of that because there's nobody you know, there's no time clock to punch and there's no one behind me saying, wow, what did you do today? And did you accomplish this and this and this? I mean, very self-motivated and very disciplined because I want my business to succeed. You think that goes back to that independent childhood and, and that whole, you know, kind of growing up in that way? Do you think that just carries right forward? Absolutely. And how about your kids? Are they, do you find them relying on you more because you're kind of a little controlling or is it do you see that independence in them? Are you able to help that? <laughs> I, said, I think I'm only that way in my business life. <laughs> okay, good. And it's funny that you use the word controlling because I'm like, I'm really not that way with them. I, I'm more of an encourager. I like oh, to cool. teach them. You know, I've 
you know, I, I do the best I can with discipline and with things like that around here. You know, I, I, I want to teach them, you know, hard work and the sense of accomplishment and the sense of, you know, the same type of thing. If you really want something done well, learn how to do it well, do it yourself, and then teach someone else to do it well. Um, and I feel like I, that's something that I have passed on. My son started mowing the lawn when he was 10, and, you know, it took him quite a long time to really learn how to do it well, and that, then he could breeze right through it, and that was a paid position. And so sometimes, you know, it, it took a while to do that, and now he's kind of passed that torch to my sister because he's moved on to other things, or not my sister, his sister. And so now she's doing it and she's in the learning process. And, you know, we just try to teach them, you know, if you want do a job, do a job well done, ask questions if you don't know how. And just the repetitiveness of doing it and accomplishing it is, you know, the reward you get. It's not just the paycheck at the end of the task. That's awesome. I mean, it's just thinking about, you know, just bringing that forward. It's just really cool. All right. So not that every, we're back to the angels and unicorns again. <laughs> there must be a weakness somewhere. <laughs> tell us. Come on. Let us know. Nobody else is listening. Go ahead. I us. think that the strength can also be the weakness. Like I said, the if you want something done right, do, in your, do it yourself mentality is very overwhelming because, um, there comes a point in this business and in any business that you reach where you cannot do it all yourself and you will need to start trusting people that that can do things that you can't do, things that are not in your wheelhouse and um, trusting them to do what they do well and hiring them to do it well rather than saying, oh, I could learn this and I could do this. Instead, it's like, who knows how to do this and how can I pay them? Because my you only have... 168 hours a week to spend. I think that's right. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good to me. And wow. So how you spend them should be best spent on the things that you do well, rather than the things that you can learn to do well. Eventually, sometimes you have to decide the good, better, best. And sometimes the I fall short in thinking I can do it all and I can learn how to do this, 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 and this, and still be good at this. And the the balance of kind of hiring things out or asking for help in certain areas is probably my biggest weakness. So you said decide your good, better, and best. Which would you do then? I mean, obviously you want to do your best, but, you know, so so let's say you did decide your good, your better, and your best. What are you going to do with that? Um, I'm going to do the thing that I'm the very best at, that I feel like I can have the best return on investment for my time. So I have to analyze that. I mean, everybody has to sit down and say, okay, I'm very good at this. I decided this recently as I started my website and my coaching and um, things like that, that I'm not much of a writer. I'm a talker. I like to do live screencasts. I am personable. I like to talk to people over the phone and face to face. And so instead of writing a blog, like a lot of people are good at, and I think, oh, that's the way to go. I realize that that's not where I need to spend my time. I need to spend my time with what I'm the best at for me, which would be videos and speaking to people live and, you know, things like this interview, because I'm better at communicating um, speaking rather than writing. And so I've decided that although that's a lot of people's way and that's a good way and it's a successful way for many people, it would take me more time and effort to be good at that rather than just honing what I'm already good at. So decide your good, better, best, do your best and outsource the rest. So what would you do with the better piece? So the good is going to get outsourced, right? Mm -hmm. That's the way you describe it. You're going to do the best because that's what you do. The good gets outsourced to somebody else, right? Somebody else's skill set. Is the better, is there a depend on it? Yeah, it really, I think with the better, it's going to depend on um, the time versus money thing. I think, okay, if, if it, there's a shorter learning curve, with something that's in the better category, then I'm probably going to try to learn it myself, especially if over the long term I'm going to need that skill anyway. If it's a short term type thing, I would probably hire it out. If it's just like a one type, one type thing task, I would hire that out. But if it's something that I think I'm going to need a skill I'm going to need long term, I would take the time in small chunks to learn that thing because that better could eventually become my best as I continually to grow uh, my business. I love it. Taking small chunks. I love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. So I, I think this is a bad question to ask you because I don't think this is a, the, uh, uh, 
I don't think this is you. You know, how'd you get past the fear to enter it? It doesn't sound like you had any fear to become an entrepreneur. It sounds like you, you're the fearless one. <laughs> is that a fair description? I, you, you are right. I, I, you know, when I read that, you know, question, I just thought, I was never afraid. I was always like, I, I'm going to do this thing. I, not that no one's ever afraid to fail. I'm, you know, failure is part of the process, and I'm okay with that. Um, but I never really look at it as fear. I say, I'm just going to do this, and it, it could only, how bad could it be? You know, that's always how I think about it. How bad could this be? If I launch a website or do a spreecast, how bad could it be? You know, and so I can only go up from there if it's terrible. Um, I've been an entrepreneur, I think, all my life, or at least business minded. Always, you know, I just think it came from childhood of how how can I save a buck? How can I spend the the best way I can spend? I mean, my dad made a deal with me when I first I think it started driver's training, where um, he would match me dollar for dollar to buy a car, and I was like, oh boy, and I worked and worked and saved and saved, and about a month or two before my 16th birthday, I came to my dad with this wad of cash. And he's like, how much is that? <laughs> he was in a panic. It was like almost $2,000. And he just thought, I, I, he didn't know what to say because he didn't realize I had that much. He thought maybe, you know, I was going to come with $500 or whatever. So he was digging in his pockets and he didn't realize that because I really wanted that car. And so I made the sacrifices that it took. You know, my friends were ordering, you know, pop and going to fast food. And I was just like, Nah, I'll pass because I really wanted a car. So I drove to school on my 16th birthday in a car that I paid for. Well, paid half for. That is so cool. So make the sacrifices necessary to be successful. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. So best advice you got? Hmm. That's really hard. I've gotten a lot of advice. Um, Be smart with money. Don't. Don't go into debt if you can help it. Uh, debt can, can be such an ankle weight for growing a business when you always have to pay someone else first before you can pay yourself or grow your business. Um, if you can, go debt-free. Now, I don't – I say debt-free in a way that, like, we do use some rewards cards, but we pay them off. Uh, we don't ever pay interest on them. You know, we use a Toys R Us rewards card to get the 10% off, but then the very next day we pay the balance with cash. So that's kind of, I mean, some people might call that, that's not debt free, but um, close enough for us. Uh, right. Not carrying a, a debt, I think is very helpful and just do something. That's just part of, that's just what's in my blood. Um, it's oh you're always you know it was an exercise tip I suppose but it says if if you're even walking slow you're still lapping everyone that's on the couch and so I kind of think about that in my head of you know even if I'm taking baby steps towards my goals I'm still I'm still moving forward. I, I think a lot of people you know again as you know you talk to enough people too is they get stuck they get to that point and they think oh my god I can't go forward or nobody else has to deal with this we all deal with it everybody does and I don't care what level they're at they're dealing with it sometimes it's just a bigger number that they're dealing with but I think this is very sound advice and I think it's absolutely smart and I think you know I get worried when I see people going out with credit cards and buying all this stuff and then they you know as summer slows down or race to the bottom occurs or, you know, whatever happens, Amazon comes in on uh, on the item. It's an issue. So I, I just think your advice is really sound. It sounds a little Dave Ramsey-ish. I've heard a couple of references there. Uh, sounds a little bit like it. Did, yeah. it. did you follow him at all? I do. I'm a fan. That's great. You're not alone. Okay. So I, I don't think we need to talk about your personal habits. I think we've gotten a bunch of them there. Um, really... Really, uh, really strong. So you're you're doing coaching right now in addition to Mommy Income. And so let's just talk about Mommy Income. What is Mommy Income? Uh, well, Mommy Income is just a, a gathering place of entrepreneurial women, moms, and family families seeking harmony and balance in business and in life. Um, we try to encourage each other. We try to help each other. Um, it's the, the uh, website, which is under construction at the moment, but it will be there soon, is, is going to be an experience of videos and little life moments and just ways to encourage people um, to do their best in business and also have the lifestyle 
um, that you want. And I think that with Amazon FBA or really any business that you're pursuing, you can have that kind of lifestyle that you desire if you work really hard, whatever you're doing. I work really hard at my business so that I can work really hard at being a mom, so that we can work really hard at having a really enjoyable, freeing lifestyle that we desire as a family. So working hard at all of those things to to get the harmony and balance that you're looking for. I, I think lifestyle is important. And, you know, it sounds to me like you've really found a really good balance. I mean, and, and the thing that, again, I go back to is your eBay experience, right? So you're able to take something that can be challenging. Let's face it, you've got a lot of work, a lot of steps that FBA, uh, Amazon FBA takes away for you, right? That's the value of doing Amazon FBA. But you're basically doing the same thing with eBay. And so, you know, as we know, is really having that multiple uh, channel, multiple uh, sources of income is a smart move because uh, you never know, right? Yeah. You never know. Um, it's a smart move. You've been able to do that in your own small way. You could scale that up theoretically. So I, I just think that's so great that you've been able to really work on that lifestyle and really uh, balance, especially with such a big family. So mm-hmm. that's great. All right. So we're at the end of the interview. And what, I, what I'm trying to get to now is something that, you know, you've really come a long way. You've really moved uh really far so far in this journey, and and you're really going to have a great year this year. Can you give us a tip, a process improvement, or something that somebody who's struggling out there today can go and put back into their business to take that next move forward? This is going to be a very non-traditional answer, but I can't tell you how valuable it really is and so that's why I'm sharing it. I think the number one thing that has helped me especially in this the first 6 months of 2015 is an accountability partner. Someone that you can tell your goals to, someone that you trust, someone that is is as motivated as you are and that you can connect with on a consistent basis. And when I mean consistent, I mean even daily, if you can, whether it's somebody that understands the type of business that you're in, Amazon FBA, if that's you, or eBay, or whatever it is that you're doing, because that's something that someone can push you along. Um, they can say, what steps have you taken today to get towards the goal that you told me about? You know, your goal is this. What have you done today to do that? And it can really light a fire under you and help you to really move forward in your business because someone's keeping you accountable. You can't sit on your hands when someone's going to call you tomorrow and say, here's what I've done. What have you done? And what what are we going to do in the next couple of days? Um, I, th- it's so valuable. It's worth more to me than any app or any program I use because that's really what keeps me motivated, knowing that those calls or those messages are coming in. And I have to kind of give an account as to how I'm moving my business forward. Um, it really helps me to to stay focused and stay on task, which if you're focused and you stay on task, no matter how big or small your business is, you will be moving in the right direction. And I assume you hold that other person accountable. It's an equal kind of relationship, right? That's correct. So there's a disappointment. Hey, she did her part or he, uh, I figure I know who yours is, but uh, they did their part. I need to do my part because I don't want to disappoint them either. So that's that's really, yeah, that is an unusual one, but it, it's it's so smart to think about that. So in addition to mommy income, in addition to selling full-time and everything else, in addition to all this stuff, you now take it on coaching. Just a brief, brief moment. Tell us what, what's going on there. I'm just trying to help people take a step up in their business. It's a personal one-on-one type coaching. Um, I take the, I try to give more value than the person will ever need. Just anywhere from I've got this money, where do I start? To I'm looking for replens. How do I work with my numbers? How do I scale up? Or I've got a shoestring budget. What do I do? Um, all those things because I've been there and done that. I've done what six Q4s so far. And so I just try to help people wherever they are and wherever they get stuck. And it can be a short term or a long term thing. Um, But it's very, uh, I just, I really just want to help people. I'd like to see people succeed. I'd like to know that, you know, they're taking the proper steps. And a unique thing about my coaching too, is that I really try to challenge someone um, to, 
to do homework. I give homework assignments because I'd like to see people succeeding and I don't want to move from A to Z. We need to move from A to B to C in a specific order to get them where they're going. And so I always give homework assignments and we go through those. And once we're unstuck on that, we'll get to the next phase and just go on and on and on so that we can just take these baby steps towards the goal that they have. It sounds like a foundational approach, and I think that that's so necessary for some people, and I don't think there's enough of it. They're asking kind of similar questions. You could tell they're stuck, so that's great. Okay, so how do they find it about the coaching, or just how do they get? How do people get in touch with you? You can get in touch with me by uh, going to mommyincome.com, and, or you could email me at kristen at mommyincome.com. And I'll be happy to answer questions you have. I also have a YouTube channel if there's a couple of things you're interested on. Um, it's small, but it's relevant to FBA. And uh, that's uh, YouTube.com slash Mommy Income, I believe. Okay. And then you also have a spreecast. Now, how frequent is that? I do. We do spreecasts every Monday night. Um, right now it's 10 p.m. Eastern time because of a summer softball schedule, but throughout the rest of the year it's 9 p.m. And you can find that at com slash Kristen Ostrander, and all the previous spreecasts will be on there. And if you click the follow button, you'll get updates on all the spreecasts. And we do a show every Monday with the exception of a few holidays. Okay, and I'm going to have all those links in the uh, right in the podcast. So, Kristen, thank you so much for taking your time out tonight. I know you got a lot going on, and we really appreciate helping people move forward. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the e-commerce momentum podcast. All the links mentioned today can be found at ecommercemomentum.com under this episode number. Please remember to subscribe and like us on iTunes.